Heavenly Father, you are the God who gives peace. This second week of Advent causes us to remember that because of Jesus, we can experience a Christmas free from turmoil and chaos. Regardless of our circumstances, you offer us a peace that passes understanding. That first Christmas when you sent your Son, you sent the one who is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Even the angels cried out, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. The angels knew your purpose. They know the gifts of hope and peace and joy and love that Christmas held. They recognized that fullness of God was wrapped in the tiny flesh of an infant as you, God, humbled yourself and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us as the baby Jesus. Amen. Lord God, you tell us to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is your will for us through Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the week that we have had. We thank you for every good meal that we have shared. 
We thank you for every kind word we have received. We thank you for every good book on our shelves or on our Kindle, for every good idea that has come into our heads, for every good message on our phone. May you, good Lord, be thanked. We thank you for gardens that rest now, for the nights of good company and good song. We thank you for the music of Advent, for inspiring words. We thank you for the wisdom of age and the smiles of children. May our wise and bountiful Lord be thanked. For people who have taught and nurtured us, for thoughtful things that have helped us and restored us, for friends who have listened to us and stayed alongside for the work of your Spirit in our lives and in the lives of others. May you, our gracious God, be thanked and praised, now and always. Amen. Our first Bible reading this evening is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, beginning to read from verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The wood and the fire are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, 
I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. And then from Luke's gospel, chapter one, starting to read at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Holy One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. We thank God for his word. The very first words of Luke chapter 2 must be surely just about the best known first words ever. Here's what they say. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And before we get to that wonderful Christmas story, we're going to look tonight at the first chapter of Luke. We're going to consider who Luke is, why he wrote the chapter. We're going to think about Zechariah and Elizabeth, the Annunciation, the virgin birth. We're going to think about how, as Neil read it earlier on, how Mary reacted in loudest praise. And then we're going to end with the birth of John the Baptist. And in all this, we're going to be thinking, how does this prepare us for the Christmas story to come? Let us pray. Come thou font of every blessing. Tune our hearts now to sing your praise. Amen. So forgive me that there'll be people here who will know this better than me, but I just want to explain a little bit, first of all, who Luke was, or what we know about Luke, which will help us understand a bit about who this person is who wrote the words that we are thinking about tonight. We know about Luke because Luke was a wonderful and loyal companion of the Apostle Paul. It was Luke 
who tells us about the early church through the, through the writing of the Acts of the Apostles. And if you look at that book, the Acts of the Apostles, that was also written by Luke, you'll see that sometimes Luke says, he speaks about Paul and his journeys, and he'll speak about how Paul and they were in such and such a place. But every so often, if you read it, you'll realize that Luke is saying, we were there, and we were doing this. So, Luke was with Paul in many of the times of the spreading of the early church, and I think it was Paul's second letter to Timothy. I may be wrong, just at the end, as Paul is in Rome and he's in chains, and Paul gives the impression of being lonely, and he speaks about how Luke is still with him. So, we know something about Luke. We know something about his goodness, about his loyalty. We also know that he spent time at the feet of the apostles, listening and absorbing the stories of Jesus Christ. And if you read the very beginning of Luke's gospel, here is what he says. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by, by those who were from the first were eyewitnesses. Now, again, just to give you a bit more background, if you ever think, how did Luke write this? Did he just get a word from God? Did he just hear, was it all just stories that he heard from other people and gathered them together? The hypothesis is this, that Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel all have a lot of similarities. A lot of the stories in it, a lot of the, the accounts of Jesus in these, in these gospels are the same. And the first hypothesis is that Mark's gospel was written first, and that Luke and Matthew had access to Mark's gospel when they were writing down their own account. That helps explain why between these three gospels there were parts of them that were the same. But there are parts of Luke's gospel that are not in Mark's gospel, but are in Matthew's gospel. So, how did Matthew and Luke come up with so many similar things? And again, the hypothesis is that there once was a gospel or a manuscript that's now been lost to time. It may be found one day, who knows? But the, the hypothesis is they, that Matthew and Luke had access to another document as well as Mark's gospel, and people call it Q, or for the German word for Kel, which means source. So, the suggestion is that Luke wrote his gospel from three things. One was based on Mark's gospel. The second thing was something called Q, or this other manuscript that now has been lost to time. And the third way that Luke came upon the things that he has written about here, he explains in the beginning of his gospel. Therefore, he says, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me also to write an orderly account. So, what seems to have happened? How we seem to got the stories, the account that we're going to read tonight, is partly based on Mark's gospel that came before, partly based on this manuscript called Q that we no longer have access to, and partly because Luke went out and interviewed the eyewitnesses. He said, I'm going to find out this. I'm going to find out what happened. And Luke went out to find the eyewitnesses and we don't know who he spoke to. But there are only a few people mentioned here in this first chapter, Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And certainly many people have thought that surely Luke must have interviewed it's Zechariah or Elizabeth or Mary, mother of Jesus. So, what we may be reading here, what we can treasure here, are the same treasures 
that Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary, mother of Jesus, knew as well. There has been some 430 years between the end of the Old Testament and now the beginning of the New Testament, what we call divine silence, what when we talk about that Jesus was the light in the darkness, this time of waiting for the Messiah to come. And where does Luke begin his gospel? Where does Luke begin this next stage of God's plan for us? Well, in Luke chapter 1, he says that the story begins in the temple in Jerusalem, in the holiest of the holies, in that place that after Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain will be ripped. But there is where Luke begins his story, in the holiest of holies, as a priest chosen by Lot, who Luke says was blameless before God, as was his wife Elizabeth, called Zechariah, is there. And Luke writes that the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah. Now, the angel Gabriel, we know something of of the Old Testament. He's spoken about, for example, in the book of Daniel. But the Jews would think of angel Gabriel as one of the four angels that are around the throne of God. The four angels that guard the throne of God. And Luke now says, remember this is based, as we understand it, as he tells us, on eyewitness testimony. Luke says that Zechariah is in the holy of holies, and the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, I know what you've been praying about. I know what you've been praying about. I know you've been desperate to have a child. You and your wife have prayed about this so, so many times. And I've come to tell you that this is true. You are going to have a son, and you're going to call him John. And more than that, he is part of God's plan because he is coming to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. 430 years of silence. I am sending one to call in the wilderness, to make straight the highway, to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah, and you are going to have that son who will be John, and he will prepare the way. Now, I don't know if you've ever prayed for anything and given up praying for it, or just about given up praying for it, and that prayer is answered. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. But if you have ever felt that a prayer is being answered by God, if you're anything like me, I wouldn't be surprised if you doubt and you say, no, I know you're good, God, but I don't believe you're that good. How can you be that good to me? How can I be so blessed? And if you're anything like me, you would have a lot of empathy, I would think, with Zechariah, who says to the angel Gabriel, how can I be sure? Me and my wife are old now. How can this be true? And the angel Gabriel says it is true. But since you have not believed, you will now be struck dumb until your child is born which not for me to say anything against the angel Gabriel at this point in our story seems pretty harsh on Zechariah, given that's exactly at the very minimum what I would do as well. It seems harsh at this stage of the story. Now, the, now in Luke's gospel chapter one, the story moves on five, six months. And we know this because now Elizabeth has been pregnant, Zechariah's wife has been pregnant for six months. And now we come to what is called the Annunciation. In other words, the announcement to Mary about the coming of Jesus Christ. And if Luke's gospel begins in the holiest of holies in the temple, the angel Gabriel now comes to what, if it was a church of Scotland parish, would be called a priority area, comes to Nazareth in Galilee, and to a young lady called Mary. In the sixth month, it says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, 
a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled, wondered what kind of greeting this may be. But the angel said, Do not be afraid. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, just thinking back very briefly to Neil's first reading, which was from Genesis chapter 2. So, we've now been told that angel Gabriel is telling Mary that, that her son will inherit the throne of David and will reign over the house of Jacob. Who was Jacob's father? If we think back to our Bible. Don't worry if it's wrong. Please, I, I sometimes have to check these things out. But in the Bible, who was Jacob's father? We've just read about him. Yeah, Isaac. So we've just read this extraordinary story of Isaac almost on, on, the, on the pile of wood and, and God and the whole story of Abraham and, and Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac then marries Rebecca, who then has the son Jacob. And this is, just see the richness of this story, how it all joins together. And here's what Mary says, how will this be since I am a virgin? Now, let me ask you a question. The virgin birth, does it matter? Does it matter? Um, many people, and smart people and right people, will say lots of the stories. Alexander the Great's one example. So many myths have a virgin birth. It's a common thing. So, the suggestion is that actually this is from from pagan stories at the time that this has been brought into Luke's gospel, and it's in line with these other stories as well, to suggest a, a sign of divinity, that, that, that Jesus was not born of a virgin. But does it matter? I want to suggest four reasons that it does matter. I want to suggest four reasons why what is written in Luke's gospel, that Jesus was born of Mary who was a virgin, matters. And the first one is this, that has mattered to the church for so long. And that may seem like a non-issue, but for 2,000 years, the church has held on to the importance that Mary was a virgin. Historians look back to the second century, and at that point in the church, across the whole church, this was an essential part of the story. It was considered essential to people's faith. And so the first reason I'm suggesting it matters is, it's because it's mattered for 2,000 years. And the church has got things wrong in the past and we've discovered things, but should we be throwing out 2,000 years of history just like that? The second thing I want to suggest why it matters is, that Luke says this is an orderly account, and it's based on eyewitness accounts. And if this is not true, what else in Luke's gospel is not true? Therefore, the second reason I would say this matters is because Luke says it's true, and we're asked to believe his gospel because he says he's gone out and thoroughly investigated this, and he's gone out to eyewitnesses as well. The third reason I'd say it matters is because the humanity of Jesus is important. The fact that Jesus was fully human is important. Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph, when they went to the temple, offered the sacrifices of the poorest. They could not afford the sacrifices that most people would be able to offer. They had to offer the sacrifices of the poorest. Jesus was brought up with poor parents. When we talk about the first, the last, and the last shall be first, Jesus lived this. Jesus knew what poverty was. We have a world of refugees. Jesus knew what being a refugee was when they fled to Egypt. 
We have a world now, think of Ukraine, where there's warfare and terror and violence. When Jesus was two years old, if we understand this right, where Nazareth says, at that time the large city was called Sepphoris, and the Romans at this time surrounded Sepphoris, and apparently the killing there was horrific. And those who survived the Romans attacking Sepphoris would spill out and spill out to places like Nazareth. Jesus knew what it was like to live through warfare. His humanity matters. Jesus Christ, who's at the throne, at the right hand of God in heaven, knows these things, knows the suffering that human beings have to go through. So it matters that Jesus was human. But it also matters, of course, that Jesus was fully divine, that He was fully God. The psalm says, sinners beget sinners. Ever since Adam, sinners have beget sinners, have beget sinners, have beget sinners. And because Jesus was born of, He was the Son of God, He was not of Adam. He was not born with that sin within him. He was the perfect one, and he needed to be the perfect one because he was going to be unblemished, and he was going to take our sin to the cross, despite the fact that he was perfect. So there are some reasons why I would suggest that the virgin birth is essential to our faith. Let me continue with the story. And eventually, as the angel Gabriel has been with Mary, Mary in verse 38 replies with the most wonderful faith, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answers. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel Gabriel left her. And that takes us to the reading that Neil read earlier. At that time it begins, in verse 39. At that time it says, Mary hurries and gets ready and hurries to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home. Now, very briefly, if you remember from when we were talking about the Good Samaritan and talking about Jesus sending out the 70 disciples, very briefly, we have a map here of Galilee with Nazareth here. We have Samaria here, which is that hostile place for the Jews. And then we have down here the hill country of Judea, roughly five miles from Jerusalem, where, of course, Zechariah has been in the temple. So, it's about a 90-mile journey for this pregnant young lady. Luke seems to infer that she goes alone, possibly in some sort of caravan. I'm not an expert, but would there be morning sickness and all these things that she has to cope with on this desperate journey as she goes to the hill country of Judea to visit her relative Elizabeth? And where she enters Zechariah's home, and greets Elizabeth. It's an obvious answer, but why is there no greeting between Zechariah and Mary? Because he can't speak. I'm beginning to wonder if that was not punishment for Zechariah. I'm beginning to wonder if who we needed at this stage in God's plan was not Zechariah with all his doubts and all his, are you sure, Mary's? What we needed was someone who would bless her. What we needed now was his wife, Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth hears Mary's greetings, the baby leaps in Mary's womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she explains, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Mary hasn't said a word. Mary hasn't said to Elizabeth, Mary, Elizabeth, I need to tell you what's happened. It's the the baby has leapt in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth, blessed Elizabeth, instead of thinking about herself, pours praise on Mary. Mary, who am I that the mother of my Lord has come to visit me? Blessed are you amongst all women. Just when Mary needs reassurance of this extraordinary thing happening, Here comes Elizabeth, and blessing her before she even says a word, and reassuring her that what the angel Gabriel had told her was true. I wonder, by the way, how much influence Elizabeth had over her son, John. 
in this whole way that Elizabeth, instead of focusing on her part in God's plan, is pouring blessings on Mary because she is the mother of Jesus. When John the Baptist grows up, when he goes out to minister, is John the Baptist popular? Does John the Baptist become popular? Yes. And does, do people start asking John the Baptist if he is the Messiah? Yes. And what does John the Baptist say? He points to Jesus. He says, I'm not even fit to tie his, his sandals. And I wonder how much of that influence of Elizabeth wears off on John. God's plan, which has been there since the beginning of time, and which will be there till the end of time when Jesus returns. God's plan is now in the hands of two young pregnant cousins. And our eyes in Luke's story now turn to Mary. How will she react to this? How will she cope with being told that she is the mother of the Son of God? Well, we know why, because we hear our song. And Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord, or magnifies the Lord, as we also know it from the Magnificat, which means almost from the word megaphone. She's shouting, she's singing, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, and they do, Mary. For the mighty one has done great things for me. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers, lifted up the humble, filled the hungry, sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever. Do you remember the end of the story of Genesis 22 that we read earlier on? after the story of Abraham and Isaac, that what happens, what does the Lord say to Abraham? Because of this, your descendants will be, will be a blessing for nations throughout the earth. And Mary, who knows our Bible, is now saying this. He has helped his servant Israel to Abraham and his descendants forever. And then Luke, the investigator, now says that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. There's a lovely ending to Luke chapter 1. It tells the story now of the birth of John the Baptist. And again, we begin to get an idea, I think, of why Zechariah was struck dumb. Because when the baby is born and the neighbors and the relatives are around and celebrating, they say to Elizabeth, who is he to be called? And she says, he's going to be called John. And they say, John? John, you've got no relatives called John. Why is he called, going to be called John? Which means God is gracious, by the way. Why is he going to be called John? And they immediately, whether this is a patriarchal thing or not, it says in Luke chapter 1, they immediately say, we'll go and ask Zechariah what he thinks. We'll go and check with Zechariah. Zechariah, of course, is dumb, so they start to make signs to him. Who is the baby going to be called? Zechariah asks for a writing tablet, and he writes down, and he says, he is John. And immediately, he is no longer struck dumb. And he now can speak, and Zechariah starts praising his God. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. But I want to just end with these most beautiful words that Zechariah says over his son. Words that remind me of the beautiful way that Naomi spoke over our grandchild at the end of the book of Ruth. This is what Zechariah says. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because, my son, of the tender mercy of our God, 
by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And that child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. And the very next words in the Bible say this, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we join together and with those listening on YouTube as we offer you now our prayers. Please, Lord God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived among us and showed us your love and who died for us to save us, we ask that in his name you hear our prayers. Lord God, we pray for those children who were at the church event yesterday. We pray for their minds and their hearts. We pray that something of yesterday can remain with them. There in the joy of Christmas, they can feel a warmth when they think of Jesus Christ. We pray for their families, Lord. We pray that they may be strengthened in their faith or come to faith and find a home in a church in this town or around. We pray for the Langley Primary School service on the 20th. Please God, may it feel more than a concert. May it feel like your Holy Spirit is blowing through this church. That the hearts of the teachers and the staff that the children, nursery, P1s to P7s, that their soul may magnify the Lord. We give you thanks, God, for Peril Brown and all that she's meant to this church. We thank you for her chat after the service for the fun when our son Kenny would come to pick her up and would stay. Thank you for those memories, Lord, that are cherished by us and remembered by you. We pray for her family. We think of Alistair and all the sons and their families. Bless them as we prepare for the funeral this week. And we pray for the soul of peril, that she be with you and at peace. Lord God Almighty, you know the stresses and strains. You know the joys that await us in the week ahead. And now in the quiet, we offer our prayers for our week ahead. Lord God, we close our prayers now as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And so may the grace of God uphold you, the peace of God surround you, the love of God flow from you, and the strength of God protect you. This evening, until we meet again. Amen. Faithful God, you'll lead me through. I will sing your praise in my darkest days. When morning breaks, I will see.